Hello guys, welcome to May 2012's edition of My Life on the Hill. Uh, it's a little bit wet, you might have noticed from the tiny little raindrops that appear in the, uh, in, the, in the camera. And Ace filmmaker John has rigged up this wonderful little waterproof system on the camera, so we're able to, to film today nevertheless. I've got a mixture of features today. One of the first things I wanted to show you was the new pond. Not because it's new necessarily, because it's new in terms of the amount of water that it now contains after the wettest April on record. Uh, I wanted to look at the uh, the vegetable patch. We're also going to take a look at the sheep because they're all very plump and, and pretty close to lambing. Uh, so we're going to look at those little guys and then hopefully next month we can get some footage of, uh, of, the, of their, uh, their offspring. So a mix of things. So uh, come and join me and let's uh, let's take a look at those bits. One of the first things I wanted to show you this month was the tadpoles in the pond. So this pond over the last couple of weeks was just a shadow of its former self. So, so dry because of the fact that we've had so little rain. Um, and really it's a bit, uh, it, you know, I was slightly concerned that it, was, it would dry out this summer if we hadn't had all the rain that we've had. Uh, but nonetheless, we've had all this fabulous rain, the British climate never, never ceases to let us down. We talk about droughts and then suddenly, boom, loads of rain. The pond is, is, is filled up again and, it, and it's a fabulous thing to walk around and look at because the, the water uh, now is so clear and it, it's almost kind of reminiscent of some sort of tropical rainforest, you know, that, that fills up in the rainy season and then uh, literally sort of uh, becomes a, t a pocket, a series of tiny little rivulets and, and uh, isolated pools. Uh, but when it's in flood, of course, you see, you can see all the all the foliage, all the vegetation completely submerged, and all the fish, of course, take real advantage of all that fresh submerged vegetation. Uh, and in many respects, it, the, the same scenario is panning out here, uh, because even though the pond was really, really low, and we had the visits from the heron all the time that kept on coming, and, and I thought pretty much the heron was going to just eat all the toads and all the frogs. It, it may well have eaten all the frogs, but certainly hasn't eaten all the toads. Uh, and, uh, and they managed to spawn, and, and nevertheless. And of course it's filled up, and we've got this monster great surface area now, and around, around the margins of the pond, it, it's inundated in a black blanket of tadpoles, a mixture of toads and frogs. I'm thinking the majority of these little black tadpoles are toads, but they're all munching on this submerged vegetation. So, you know, the, the, the creeping thistles and the teasel, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the mixture of conventional grasses uh, are, are providing a wonderful, uh, kind of smorgasbord for all these tadpoles, really. I don't know whether it's eating that toad spawn or whether it's just. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at this crazy looking monster. Oh, yes, now that's whatever it is, the larvae of some th unfortunate beast. And it is literally feasting on the toad spawn. The other way it's... Whoa, I can feel it! <laughs> Nibbling in my finger! <laughs> uh, it's quite weird. It's fascinating, I came down a couple of days ago um, fully expecting to see very few tadpoles in here and, and I was surprised to see as many uh, that are obviously present. Um, but one of the things I was more surprised about was some brand new toad spawn. And what's happening here is that whilst the brand new toad spawn, all those little tiny uh, it's sort of embryonic eggs are trying to feast on the jelly in order to be able to morph into a, a tadpole. They, um, they're not going to be able to do that because unfortunately the big raft of uh, tadpoles that are, that are at least six weeks old, possibly eight weeks old now, are eating the jelly around the eggs. So it's unlikely that those guys are going to come to fruition. But what it does show is nature's way of being able to back up uh, any eventuality because it, those toads were in here in March spawning away and uh, and literally two months later some sexually matured toads turned up and released another dollop of, of eggs just in case that first batch weren't successful. <laughs> These, uh, these ewes now are so big, they're uh, literally, I mean, they could sort of lamb at any time. They're, they're not really due until the beginning of June, but you know, sometimes if the lambs start to develop quite quickly, uh, off the back of good grazing, which they've obviously got now, you know, because of all this rain we've had, then uh, they, can, they can lamb earlier. 
I'm giving them these this uh, this cake now these uh, these sheep nuts because there's you know a lot of protein in there so it kind of builds up the size of the lamb really and the robustness of the lamb and these old girls are starving they can't eat enough grass really to sort of keep them going to keep those lambs building and growing inside them so I'm looking forward to uh, to seeing what the lambs are like because it was a slightly different cross we used a slightly different tuck this year we borrow tuck we don't have our own there's no point in keeping a tuck these two girls here are lambs that we've kept so these are across Ryland um, with uh, with um, Texels these are this wonderful little woolly bear faced sheep of Rylands this one in fact is the daughter of this black one and that one is the daughter of the white one uh, she's had lambs for the last couple of years these this one here hasn't lamb had lambs at all so uh, it'll be interesting to see how she gets on uh, whether or not she's had twins or whether or not it's just a just a single lamb so it's very exciting lambing and in some respect because of this dreadful damp weather I'm so glad we've you know we, we uh, put them to the tub later on so we've got lambs in June rather than in April or May um, that we normally will have done um, you can hear behind me you know there are lambs in the orchard behind me uh, relatively big lambs you know they're six eight weeks old now um, but uh, yeah these guys have yet to uh, to give birth so uh, yeah I'm looking forward to that with bated breath <laughs> brought you down here to show the cuttings, the willow cuttings that I put in in the winter time uh, and I, in fact I did this with my little daughter on my backpack and uh, Lily was kind of being shaken around as I jammed the bar into the ground and then just simply pushed these willow rods into the holes that I made with the bar. This this kind of space down here is ideal in many respects because it's very moist now, the bottom of the field uh, so these new cuttings will have plenty of moisture in order to be able to throw out some nice rootlets and uh, and it's a thrill really to see them shooting now it's a very very simple process uh, so it's it's great to be able to turn this space into into a nice little productive zone really you see this uh, this stump here for those of you who watched the very first episode of my life on the hill I cut that off with Lil and we logged it up and I used some of those long rods for some uh, from a, for a miniature hurdle around the uh, the raspberry canes up in the garden so it's a, it's a wonderful space, very easy to create. I mean, you can build a little willow bed, little patch like this in your own garden. If you have some woven fabric to lay over the ground, weedproof membrane, stick the rods in the ground, you know, 30 centimeters deep. In 12 months time, you'll have four foot uh, willow stems, a whole bunches, clusters of four foot full. And in, you know, in, in a couple of years time, they'll be 10 foot tall. <laughs> Before I go, the last thing I wanted to show you before the heavens open up again is, uh, is the, the downside of a wet spring. Because whilst the willow's done, doing fabulously well, all those lovely little rootlets are being thrown underground because of the back of all that moisture, the slug and snail activity in the garden this year has been horrendous. And for the very first time, I've had to buy slug pellets. Now, I hasten to add, they're not slug pellets with metaldehyde in, not those classic little blue poison toxic little things uh, that kill all sorts of things in addition to slugs and snails but I bought a pack of the ferric phosphate uh, uh, pellets which uh, I'm not entirely sure how well they're working but it was just a, a you know a way of being able to control those little pesky keel slugs that are just decimating the veggies and I'll show you something now uh, radishes have really suffered off the back of these little perishes and that little keel slug there unfortunately not only is it munching the leaves of my radishes but of course it's also munching the main stem as well and, uh, and there's not the trouble is there's not much on a radish to trim up so you know having the uh, slugs munch on it for as much as they do for as long as they do does tend to compromise the uh, the uh, the value of the plant so I've scattered these little pellets around hopefully that will uh, bump off some of these little monsters. This little chap obviously doesn't uh, uh, have uh, much of an affinity for eating ferric phosphate so I'm going to just deal with it in a, in a very sort of conventional way. And uh, there you go, dead slug.
Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of My Life on the Hill. See you next time. Thank you.